Welcome everyone to the Stockbridge Library, Museum and Archives Online Poetry Series. We are delighted today to have poet Irene Sipos with us. Um, Irene earned her Master of Arts in the sometimes referred to as legendary 1970s English department of SUNY University at Buffalo. And she has recently retired from SUNY Buffalo State where she taught in the English department and the college writing program. In addition, she was a co-founder of Buffalo State's Rooftop Poetry Club, which sounds really fun. When we finish doing Zoom poetry, I'd like to join the Rooftop Club. Um, Irene's work has appeared in Lilith Magazine, The Comstock Review, Earth's Daughters, The Jewish Journal of Western New York, Art Voice, as well as several others. And she recently published a book of poems titled Stones, which perhaps Irene, you'll read us a few selections from today if we're lucky. And Irene is currently working at the Writing Center at Buffalo State and is a freelance editor and tutor. Eileen, we're delighted you're here. And just a few words about John Gillespie. Um, when John started this program for the Stockbridge Library, he was the president of our board of trustees, um, which we were very lucky to have. And he had a great idea when we were all on lockdown in April of 2020. And we've had such wonderful response to the program that here we are three years later. John, thank you so much yeah. to you from all of us here at the library and from the poetry community. I'd like to now turn the program over to you. Yeah, Wendy, thanks a lot. Thanks to the Stockbridge Library for continuing to support the program. Yeah, it's uh, it's one of my favorite things during the week, whether it's Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. So, uh, no, great event every week. So, Irene, let's let's start uh, as we normally start with, you know, what does inquiry mean to you? John, I love that question. I love that question because it speaks to the heart of poetry for me. I, I think that all poetry is inquiry. It's uh, poetry asks, that's the fundamental work of poetry is to ask questions. Who are, who are we? Who am I? Who are you? What are we doing here? The big questions and the little questions. So whether a poem is presented in a question format with punctuation and a question mark or not, I think that it is all, it's all about inquiry. It's all about exploring and, and wondering. So how does that how does that show up in your poems? Is it is it something that you're, you know, it's kind of a lens you're always thinking of inquiry when you start writing, or is it just kind of arrive somehow during the writing process? Hmm. I guess it's something, it's kind of buried, but it's there. It's always there. And I think it's there when I read poetry of others and I want to bring in some, some of those poems. Um, we, we listen and we observe as poets. And when we pay attention and when we listen to others and to the world around us, there are so many mysteries. I mean, yeah. what do we know about birth, about life, about death? You know, what do I know about what difficult questions you might ask me in a little while that I will look like a jerk because I don't know how to answer everything. Every, there, everything is unknown, basically. I mean, that's the point of view of a poet. I guess if I were a mathematician or an engineer, and thank goodness there are those people because they can answer different kinds of questions, right. solve things. Yeah. yeah. In my world, the debits equal the credits, which is good. Everything <laughs> has to balance out. Okay. Of course, I don't know if that worked for Silicon Valley Bank, but it usually works for most people. So that's my my banking joke for today. Um, so when you just to, to jump off this for a minute. So when you taught your writing course, was inquiry, you know, part of the process for your students? 
Yes, thank you for that question. Um, absolutely, I think any any writing endeavor involves inquiry. And the writing that I taught was um, college writing, which is writing across the disciplines. So it's for students who, no matter what the major. Yeah. Um, and so we did, we would do a research paper as part of the syllabus, but I wouldn't assign a specific topic most of the time. I would ask students, what do you want to know about? What matters to you? So that they had real engagement with the research that they were doing. You know, we do research and I would tell them so as to make it maybe less in intimidating. We, we, we do research all the time when we ask questions of our friends, you know. Um, I love that plant or that jacket that you're wearing. You know, where did you get it? Tell me about it. Tell yeah. me. Yeah. And so that's really, you know, person to person research, asking questions. You forgive me? Yeah. What happened? Someone said something. Uh, that's okay. okay. Um, so just to, I'm going to ask this question a different way. So when you're writing some of your poetry now, are you trying to ask a question or answer a question? Or are you just, you know, there's so many ways a poem can turn out. I'm just wondering if, uh, you know, just in you, you know, you've been listening on a lot of shows, you know, everyone, no one probably has one way to do it. <laughs> they all have four or five ways. I was just wondering, when you write, is there some way that you're thinking about, you know, it's like, I've got to answer a question, or I just have to kind of let the experience flow. I'm just trying to under have the group understand you as a as a poet, how you do it. Okay, thank you. Yes, many of the poets who've been in this series have, have spoken about um, asking a question and not knowing where it will take them. And that that's the part of the, the joy and the magical part of writing. Um, back to the writing classes, there's a, a mantra in teaching writing, which is that in college or in elementary school or whenever, we learn to write, but we also write to learn. That when we begin writing, when we begin the process of writing, something happens, doors unlock in our brains, and we, we find out more about both what we already know, what background knowledge we might have, and what questions we might have about it, it where we're going and that's often a surprising process I don't, I don't know if i'm i'm not consciously thinking um what is my question but i think on on some deep level it's all about questioning what life is all about what we're doing here any any yeah. poem or any piece of art or dance or yeah i think when i i read a lot of newspapers when i look at the new york times i got a lot of questions <laughs> how do people do really do what they do and i some of it is not good yeah i'm just trying to um yeah that's I'm, for sure yeah i call it the new abnormal there's no new normal it's the new abnormal i'm um mm -hmm. yeah i i've given up trying to really reconcile it and understand it and just basically oh it's a piece of news. Oh, it's a piece of news, and I'm going to move on to something else, maybe that I could understand. So, are there uh, some poems you'd like to read for us? Yes, I would. Those, those kind of questions, John. Those are the. Uh, those are the. Mm, you know, those are often devastating. I mean, why? Whether we're talking about Ukraine or climate yeah. or politics, those are the questions that I too I. I can't begin to answer. I can think about them, but I certainly don't have any answers. Yeah. Well, so, what's good about poetry is there's there's no specific need for a poetry fact checker. Right. <laughs> That's what I like about poetry. Whenever I read the newspaper, I don't know. Is that really true? Could it be true? You know. So no. But I'm I'm getting off course here. But uh, I think that's what I love about poetry is it, it, you can. You can just write the story. 
freely. So. Right. There, there, we have ambiguity and we honor ambiguity in yeah. poetry. Yeah. We don't, it's not geometry. There's not proofs or facts. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 And that's one of the fun things, the different interpretations. I'm in a couple of poetry groups and do you hear this echo? Yeah, it's an echo. I don't know what to do about that. No, no, just, yeah, just keep going. Okay. Um, it's so much fun to experience a poem with in one group or with one friend or and then take it somewhere else and interpretations are so varied. Yeah, yeah. That's perfect. Oh, great, great. Well, I wanted to share, um, I'm, I want to bring in some other poets to help us here. So, Absolutely. Okay, thank you. I have a little poem by Hafiz. He was born 1325 in Persia. And this tiny poem is something that I keep where I can see it. Um, it's simply four little lines. How did the rose ever open its heart and give to the world all its beauty? Mm. Isn't that a beautiful little question? Yeah. yeah. So that, yeah. that's one of those fundamental. Mm. Very nice. There's not an, there's not an answer. <laughs> I don't think. Um, I wanted to share a poet who we all know of and who is so very popular and one of her most quoted poems and most quoted lines from the poem is A Summer Day, Mary Oliver. Yeah. And she opens the poem with explicit questions. Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? I'm going to skip several lines. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I've been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? In the last two lines, Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Yeah, that's such a classic ending line. That's like a, woohoo. Yeah, I love that ending line. Every time I hear it, I feel like, okay, I better stop. I've got too many papers on my desk. I got to stop what I'm doing and figure out what I'm going to do with my wild and crazy life. No, I love that. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. That's a, That's one of those, well... The journey is my favorite poem, Mary Oliver's poem, and that starts oh. with, you know, you woke up and you knew what you had to, you know, whatever. It was like a call to action, and this ending one is a call to action. I love her, the way she can put one line that just yes. blows it up. So the yeah. body of the poem that I didn't read again is about observing. She's just seeing that little grasshopper in the moment she's asking questions of the grasshopper and then she opens it to this fundamental question yeah and, oh i have something else from her yeah. mysteries yes um I, it's not long i think i can read it all yeah, do it. truly we live with mysteries too marvelous to be understood how grass can be nourishing in the mouths of lambs, how rivers and stones are forever in allegiance with gravity, while we ourselves dream of rising, how two hands touch and the bonds will never be broken, how people come from delight or the scars of damage to the comfort of a poem. Let me keep my distance always from those who think they have the answers. Let me keep company always with those who say, look and laugh in astonishment and bow their heads. Hmm. So I love that. Yeah, very nice. So, and mysteries, ambiguity make many people nervous. I mean, I think that's what we see in the recent politics that we see from the southern states from florida it has to be yep. this way or that way where 
afraid to enter those mysteries, but that that's again what our work as humans is about. Mm, yeah, no, that's right. Good. So, do you, do you have some of your own work you'd like to share? Okay, sure. And then I have a. I mean, the other stuff is fantastic. So, I mean, we had. I think we had one poetry show where, I think two thirds of it was other. And I never knew it. I and mean, he kept just going really? on other stuff. I'm doing this, I'm doing that. Like it was great. It was fantastic. So well, we rest well, on the shoulders of these remarkable. Yeah. Yeah. But this is a poem of mine that is about the issue of definition and uh, mystery and ambiguity. We were in Austin, Texas for a wedding, and uh, we stayed near a lake called Lady Bird Lake, which everyone told us is not really a lake, it's a river. And that intrigued me. Lady Bird Lake. Lady Bird Lake is a lake that is a river in Austin, Texas, that reminds me of the girl who is a boy, the boy who is a girl, or the young person who feels old, or the old person who feels young, which reminds me that often there's more to the story than a simple name, and we might do well to listen to the whole narrative if we want to understand, for instance, the lake that is a river whose destiny reaches the sea. So, nice. thank, you. thank you. No easy, easy definitions. Um, no, keep going, keep going. Okay. You know, we'll get it. Well, you know, another few minutes, we'll do a little Q and A part. Okay. Well, maybe this is maybe this is the last poem I'll bring from somebody else. But the poem "Ask Me." by William Stafford is like a nesting doll of questions. I, I think it's just, it's just a fascinating poem. So the title, the title is Ask Me. And who is Stafford inviting or asking to ask him? And what question is he inviting this person or presence to ask? Pre presumably, he to me, he's he's saying, ask me about the meaning of my life. So I'll read it and then we could talk about it. Maybe people have questions about it. Ask me, sometime when the river is ice, ask me mistakes I have made. Ask me whether what I have done is my life. Others have come in their slow way into my thought and some have tried to help or to hurt. Ask me what difference their strongest love or hate has made. I will listen to what you say. You and I can turn and look at the silent river and wait. We know the current is there, hidden, and there are comings and goings from miles away that hold the stillness exactly before us. What the river says, that is what I say. So what do you think, John? Does he give does he give an answer to the question? Uh, yeah, I don't think there's no <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a, a dance around the maypole on that one. No, he doesn't there's no answers there. It's a lot of uh you know thinking and well the, the, the river is ice. So at first the river seems to be impenetrable, solid. Yeah. But he talks about that current, that ever moving current yeah. in ice. It's always changing, it's always moving. So I think what he's saying is that our life is not what we have done. It's not, it's not that little bit of our bio or you see in the in an obituary, so-and-so house painter, cement mixer. Our, our life it's it's not it's our hidden depths it's our hidden currents it's our hidden heart yeah no great what says, that's what i say uh Anything? so for some of the new people listening in we have a little uh q a time so you can either ask irene a question 
or provide some comments. So um, I can only see, oh, I see a lot of you. So uh, yeah, and of course uh, we love family members, Rebecca, you know, to share some things that will embarrass Irene. No, only kidding, really kidding. We had one show where there were, uh, I, I think there were four members of the family on and uh, the poet said, well, if I write for one person, the other person doesn't like it. <laughs> so uh, anybody with questions or comments or? I have a comment. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, Irene, thank you so much uh, for many of your comments and thoughts today. Um, the, the opening with Hafez, uh, I, I think it's no ruse was yesterday for that holiday so oh um, yes i that's right iranian uh, new year but there's something i wanted to say you mentioned we in poetry we honor ambiguity and i just love that i i love that um you stated it that way also you brought in dance and other art um art forms uh, and i'm not sure if you knew uh, Joseph Pichillo at yes. Buffalo State. Yes, uh, I knew of him, sure. Oh, uh, he was one of my art education uh, professors at Buff State. He said that he never wanted uh, to teach a fine arts course because of, for certain reasons. But as an, an, art, um, an art professor, he was committed to art education, which uh, really impressed me. And he mentioned ambiguity. I think his his preference. Um, it, I can't say for exactly. Don't quote me on that. But his preference was for a little mystery and ambiguity in art, in the artwork. So I I thought how interesting that was that uh, you said we honor ambiguity because I I think um, and that can very much be an issue of people's taste. And also your Ladybird Lake poem was just. Uh, uh, very, very impacting. Beautiful poem, Irene. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you very much. And before we go on, I, I really do want to thank John and Wendy who, who do this. Thank you for inviting, including me. And thank you for doing this every week. It's really quite astonishing. I don't know how you do it. Yeah, I get, I'm chained to a poetry desk. That's what happens. I can only go so far. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 listen, I think it's the same way I feel about travel. I don't like getting there, but I like being there. So it's the same with no poet. No, there's a lot of like dates and changes. And, right. you know, we had the snowstorm thing and then Wendy wasn't around and I had to call a board member. Yeah, it's the whole thing is there's a lot of it's not big mechanics, but part of it is I love this hour. This hour recharges my batteries. I'm, I'm like, I'm like. I'm like the rose blooming for the next three days because I've had my poetry charge. No, Do you yeah. write, John? No, I didn't write that. No. Actually, I just took a poetry writing workshop, my first one. And I, you're going to laugh. So I didn't know. I wrote all the stuff before the workshop. And then the woman says, okay, now we're going to write during the workshop. Okay. <laughs> Actually, I rewrote most of the stuff during the workshop. So, oh boy, what are you going to do? <laughs> Anybody else have a question? Michael, go ahead. Yeah, I just have a quick question for you, Irene, and thank you so much. It's, it's great to hear you read and, uh, and John giving everybody an hour as a landing place for uh, somewhere to go each week. Um, I, I loved the uh, uh, Lady Bird Lake and just there's so much around, there's always more to the story and it is so powerful. And as Teresa said, there's so much in there. And I am curious about the structure of that poem. And if you would be able to talk a little bit about that, because there's so much in there and it's, there's so few words and perhaps lines. I'm hmm. curious how you set that up. Well, I don't know if you can see this, but it yep. does kind of open up. Yeah. Oh. Wow. To, yeah. To, um, call to mind the the lake and the river and the opening 
Wow, that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you. I wanted to try to get the movement. Yeah. Thank you, Irene. Thank you. Well, anybody else before we? I can you know what I always say. Don't let the poet off the hook. <laughs> this is your chance to uh, ask the tough question. No, only kidding. Teresa already knows. Teresa went through the gauntlet, so she already knows. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's fine. No, all good stuff. And thank you, so many friends who are here who are taking this hour. Thank you for being yeah. here. Uh, so I'm not seeing any more hands being raised. So Irene, let's okay. Let's let's. Here's some more of your poetry. Now, I love what you've shared with other people, but I think I think your Ladybird uh, Lake got rave reviews, so we want to hear more of what you've written. Thank you. Okay. Well, th this this poem is wondering about other people's experiences. It's called Hoping Our Grandmothers Found a Way. What did our grandmothers do for yoga? Not what did they do to promote yoga, but when did they get to imagine themselves as a tree or a star, a cobra, a half moon, or a happy baby? I see my grandmother in her black lace-up shoes, her neatly belted dress, gold clasped pocketbook by her side in her mid-sixties. But I don't see her nose to earth, her right knee to left elbow, or both legs up in the air. Did an instruction manual come with age for our grandmothers? You may stand at the stove or sink, and yes, do make yourself comfortable on the sofa in the den, but do not drag a mat to the floor to pretend you are a downward facing dog. Maybe the radio on the nightstand, maybe a trip on a train, maybe the glider on the front porch, or simply sitting in a pew offered away. I wonder, did anyone say to our grandmothers, this is your time, your body, your breath? Wow, that's awesome. Wow. <laughs> that, that turns yoga on its head. <laughs> well, things have changed. I mean, you know, we we now we can be in our seventies or eighties and dress the same as our four and five year old grandchildren and do the same kind of activities. You know, if if our health permits, we we don't have to live in that kind of framework that I think existed before. I don't know if I'm right about that, but I think people used to think more you had to be dignified in a certain way or respect certain boundaries when you were a grandmother. Yeah, my grandmother, my dad's mother lived with us for, I don't know, quite a while. We kind of had a boarding house family with different family members. And I mean, you love this. Her yoga was playing cards, smoking cigarettes and having a drink. <laughs> okay, well. And then teaching the kids how to play cards. Yeah, you were... <laughs> Yeah, that was her. That was her. Yeah, teaching. We went to card school. Yeah, we play. We must have owned eight or nine games because part of it, someone would just call you. Where, hey, we're going to play a game of whist. Come over here. Yeah, yeah. The kids were always sucked into the whole. Yeah, she was. I wish I could go back. I, I'm gonna have to write something about that. You know, like a science fiction thing. I wish I could go back just for one day and just observe her, and Absolutely. play cards with her or do some stuff with my dad. I mean, ah, those memories. I think that a lot, John. I think, I don't know, something just came up on my screen that I don't know how to get rid of. Um, deny? There. Um, if only people could appear just for an afternoon, you know, yeah. so that we could have a conversation like, okay, we accept you're not here most of the time, but couldn't we just have one more conversation? Couldn't we just do this last thing together? Yeah. I think there's one more poem. You know, you could start. I found my grandmother with her legs up in the air. <laughs> <laughs> and I called, they didn't have 911 at the time, but you know, you're... <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. I know I'm, I'm, I'm being too humorous today, I guess. No, 
humor is always good. You you haven't met my husband. He's a he's a jokester. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. Well, other other questions um, are the more the poet writing as you were kind of hit, hit, getting at before. How will I approach the poem? You know, what yeah. what does this poem? What questions am I? What is what will the format be? What words? What what punctuation? What style? Are there too many adjectives? Am I worthy to pursue this subject? So there's the questions that the poet, of course, has of herself. Um, and so this is this is a poem about that kind of struggle. It's called Was There Ever? So it is a question. Was there ever a more splendid fall day, bluer sky, redder leaves, brighter sun? I asked the romantic poets to walk with me this morning. Come, Wordsworth, Shelley, Keats, rhyme this beauty for me, name it, versify. Oh, but we have, they reply. Enjoy your solitary amble. When you return home, we'll be there third shelf of the white bookcase. You try to find the words they suggest. Sighing, I kick at blazing heaps of leaves, but it's not possible, I respond. You are whizzes and I'm an amateur stuck in the 21st century. Skepticism is the principal mode these days. We have lost the language of the sublime. Mm. So how, yeah. how, how to write that poem? Yeah, yeah. No, very nice, very nice. Uh, great. About rewriting, um, there's a little story that re about revision. Oscar Wilde was at a social event and he asked to be excused from socializing. And um, his host asked him, how did the morning go? And he said, um, oh, oh, it was great. I put a comma in my poem. And then she said, um, oh, and how did the afternoon go? He said, I took it out again. It was challenging. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There's some heavy lifting. <laughs> There, there's so much revising and there's so many questions that go into revising. And as I was saying before, I mean, I can, Perry couldn't be here today, but I can show him a poem and he'll make a comment and then I can show it to Ganilla and she'll make a different comment. And, you know, the poet has to decide, hmm, you know, what, what, what do I want here? So, I mean, just tell, tell us a little bit more about, you know, your writing. You know, some poets have a specific discipline where they try to write every morning or, you know, they carry around a notebook and capture different thoughts or prompts. You know, is there a method that you use more often to, you know, let your creativity come out? No, I've thought about that notebook idea, but I'd, I've never really kept at it. Um, I think I've usually tried in my life to jam poetry into the other things that I do. Until recently, I had a full-time job, um, kids, um, parents. I don't have parents. My kids are grown, but now I have grandkids, and I'm still working. And um, I, I try to sneak it, I guess, into, I think the, even though I'm my best self in the morning, the most optimistic time of day yeah. for me, but I think at the end of the day, not night, but around five o'clock, done with certain responsibilities, that's when I kind of like to go to my desk and try to do some work. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. Oh, yeah, there's very good. <laughs> so let's just take, I mean, I think it's a good time just for another okay. uh, Q&A because, uh, you know, I don't know if, uh, you know, some people on the show maybe remember Bill Cullen and Beat the Clock it used to be a game show on TV. And I always loved it when those light bulbs went out. That's that's what I feel like with Poetry Hour. All of a sudden the light bulbs start going out and we're done. So does anybody else have any 
uh, questions, I'd, comments. I'd like, to, I'd like to hear more of her work. If you yeah, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. More, you know. Okay. I am curious about one thing, though. You did say that you don't use a notebook, but how do you remember some of these phrases? I mean, because sometimes they come not connected to anything, right? You know, okay. and you think, oh, hmm, that's kind of an interesting line. I don't know where that would go. So how do you remember those? <laughs> I have to write them down because then I can't find them. But Exactly. <laughs> I'm always losing phrases, and, and that's... Um, a way that I often begin too, not so much with a subject, but yeah, some intriguing words that you overhear or that just some little glimpse of something. Exactly. Yeah. And, and that happens, you know, you're making dinner and think, oh, <laughs> I'll remember that in two hours, but it doesn't always happen. So I guess that notebook's a good idea. Probably some of the people here do that. Yeah. Do, you, do you recommend it, people? Yeah. 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 Michael's nodding his head, Teresa. <laughs> well, in terms of other of people having different responses to one poem to the same poem. Um, uh, oh, here I do have this here. Um, The next poem I want to read was, I, I was asked if it could be included in two different art exhibits in which a poem was placed on a wall next to <coughs> painting, a drawing, or a photograph. And what was interesting is that in one exhibit, um, one image was, this was the image that was used you know, by another, can you see it? It's a woman on a subway train who looks very tired. And the other image I don't have, but it was a woman with her head tilted back laughing. So a moment of joy. So it was interpreted almost oppositely. Tired, sitting across the aisle on the B train, I look at the row of weary faces. Various shapes, sizes, colors, ages, a horizontal explication of what it means to have woken many mornings, to brave routine, to leave concerns at home, along with scattered laundry and unwashed dishes, to head for same, same at work. I regard each of you one at a time. I try to observe without you knowing. And suddenly I see round, soft faces, no creases in foreheads, no wrinkles like parentheses around eyes, no downturned mouths, no slumped shoulders. I see the plump babies you once were. And with that, a rush of hoping you were affectionately held on generous laps. You were sung tender songs. You were offered a bowl of blueberries as initiation to the messy pleasures of this world. I hope occasionally you reach back, if only briefly, to recall your beginning self as a visitor new to this planet, unencumbered and dear. Wow. So, so the the one artist who put something with it picked up on those last lines about mm. joy, and mm. the mm. other had taken a photograph of a very fatigued, weary-looking woman on the subway. Mm. Wow! Nice. Very nice. So we have to. Yeah, read a few more. We have we have plenty of time. Okay. Well, I mean, before you before you while you're looking for the next poem, I just want to tell everyone I put something in the chat. You know, if you want to be on our list uh, to receive the weekly emails about our next poetry program, I put my email address in there. You can just email me. We don't use it for anything else. It's only used for the poetry weekly announcements. So if you want to get a heads up and a zoom link and things like that 
uh, you know, send me your, you know, email me at the address shown there. So that's it. Okay. Um, well, it's kind of a question poem. Well, it could be anything. There could oh, be some okay. experience poem. There could be some, uh, I'm, I, you know, I think, uh, you know, the hour just goes where it goes. Okay. So part of it is if there's a, if there doesn't have to be a question, it just could be a, you know, okay. I don't know, you had a great visit to the Lady Bird Lake. Maybe there's another visit there to. Uh, okay. All right. I, I did have this in mind when I was thinking of poems. So I'll read this poem, Freelance. You want to know why the sky is white on an August day. You want to know why the wood fits the way it does. Why there ain't no balance in this world, no matter how many times you measure. Test again with that level, but still it's toppling. All the rich ones over there, all the hungry ones over here, the talkers and the not talkers, the barking dogs and the quiet ones, the men and the women who want stuff and don't want stuff, and who got too much time and don't got any. It's crooked, won't lie down right. You want to know where to go with it, what to do with it. How do you try? Can you transmogrify with with words, with paint, with nails. The sky is wide open. It's hot. It's white. The porch is broken. It's unsteady. The mantelpiece is detaching. You want to know why? Why the sky? Why? A friend of ours was fixing our porch, and that's what came to mind. He's a fantastic carpenter and also an artist. Wow. No, that's a great poem. That was a great question. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. Thanks. Well, um, maybe just a couple more. Yeah, a couple more. Yeah. Mm. International student. You sit next to me in the writing center and apologize for your English. I do not know one word of your language, not even one letter of the alphabet. But you worry about those frustrating articles, uh, and, the, sometimes necessary and other times not. The rules seem illogical. You have spent many hours preparing this first draft. As we work together, I'm thinking of the warm country you've traveled from. I'm thinking of the family you must be missing, the flavors, sounds, customs you have exchanged to test yourself alone on this campus, thousands of miles from home. You have questions for me about syntax and structure, which I try to answer. I have questions for you, which do not fit in our 30 minute session about determination and heart. Mm. Wow. Nice. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, I think you pulled a Mary all there at the end. You got that little, little, little zip at the end. Yeah, nice. Uh, well, I was also thinking about but I, I won't, I guess I won't go and read the whole thing. But Billy Collins questions about angels. You know, it's a title of one of his books and it's also a marvelous poem in which he wonders about the questions people ask of angels that are confined to how many angels can dance on the head of a pen. And he asks many other questions. So look that poem up if you're so inclined. Yeah. Mm. Well, I mean, let me ask you this. Does your daughter have a favorite poem of yours? I, I just don't know. How much did you share your poetry with your family when you're, you know, did you like test drive it in the kitchen at breakfast? To, uh, <laughs> see, see how it landed or? Uh, with my husband, I, I, and I've shared with my kids. Becca is a poet herself. Um, what, what do you think, Becca? Do you want to respond to that? My mom was so busy always working and being involved with other things that her identity as a poet was kind of more private. And, and it's only been in the last number of years that she's really stepped into that identity and has 
encouraged me well just through her example I have felt like I can step into my identity as a poet also but she's always encouraged me to write um poetry and I'm inspired by seeing her have a her first book when she's in her 70s and take more time for it I know she said she still doesn't tries to just sneak it in but she does take a little more time for herself to do it now and I I think that's just a beautiful thing to see that and it's never too late to to step into your identity of who you are and what you create. Very nice. nice. Thank you. Very nice. Nice response, Becca. Thank you. Anybody? I just, my name is Zachary. And if I may, just for a second, thank you so much, Irene, for especially for reading your poems. And I guess one of the things that I think of as I listen to your voice, especially reading your poems, but also hearing Rebecca, who is of course your daughter and my wife, is the legacy, the living <laughs> legacy of poetry that there's this lineage of Irene, you being you and your path and how that's impressed upon your daughter, Rebecca. And in a particular reality, that legacy led Rebecca and I to discovering one another. Yeah. And that led to, you know, two grandchildren of yours. So the power of poetry in real lives is not only intangible, but also very, very tangible. Wow, well, that's beautiful, Zachary. Thank you. And your response, Becca, beautiful, very touching. I'm glad this is recorded so I can. <laughs> yeah, that was quite a. Yeah. Zachary, I think that's, that's a poem unto itself. So you ought to get that down on paper. <laughs> that was fantastic. Well, you are both people very full of inquiry. And, and you did. It's true. You met kind of over a book yeah words words the importance the power that's the other part of the title of this inquiry and the power of poetry yeah yeah, yeah. well so I, we have a few more minutes do okay. you have one or two more yes, to share yeah yeah i mean just once again i'm not i'm not trying to rush you just that i think people yeah. are are okay. salivating for <laughs> I don't think so, but okay. Election 2016. Oh boy. <laughs> Maple leaves flutter gold, pin oak leaves shimmer red, sun shines brightly. Becca exclaims that the air has turned iridescent pink. At the corner, we greet our friend and her daughter walking on their way to vote at the Unitarian Church. They wear borrowed pantsuits, too big, floppy. At first, we don't get it. Then we laugh. We also voted with confidence this morning for our first woman president. We hug and wish each other well. By nightfall, our optimism is slipping. Through the evening, we worry more. We wait anxiously for the final count at 3 a.m. Next morning, we startle awake from the nightmare that has just begun. I light three candles in glass jars, inviting fire. The past is never dead, said Faulkner. It's not even past. We carry the weight and we repeat mistakes as a poster held high at the Women's March on Washington read, my arms are tired from holding this sign since the 70s. Sea salt and ginger, frosted snow, balsam and cedar. I like diversity, even in candles, whose gentle glow brings a memory of the um, small fireplace in our carriage house, 1977, which was framed by a mysterious fresco. Vines dripped from the ceiling, owls and snakes peered out from brown and tangled branches. The artist we were told had studied in Florence. No heat or electricity. The blaze from this fire warmed us through the famous blizzard. We concocted cowboy chili on the hearth where we later curled up in sleeping bags 
dreaming as wind howled and embers crackled of the progress we believe to be unfolding in our time, finally, towards social equality and peaceful compassion. 40 years ago, dear marchers, what did we know? Mm. A long poem, but. Fantastic. Thank you. Progress. Is there progress? Maybe the, maybe the last one I should read should be a Passover poem since Passover is coming. Yeah, absolutely. All right. And I guess, you know, again, it's a poem. Well, it's inquiry and it's about thinking about time and the unity of time and the distance of time and how we can feel that we're in one place or another. Passover. Every year, we imagine ourselves trudging across burning sand, anticipating the next insurmountable task we will be forced to do. How thirsty we are, how hungry, how weary. This year, beautiful pink hydrangeas grace the Passover table. Deep pink tablecloths and napkins make us feel we could be at a sweet 16 or on an Audrey Hepburn movie set. If we are not for ourselves, who will be for us? If we are not for others, who will we be for? These are the central questions as we labor under relentless sun, as we submit to the cruel commands of a fierce despot who doesn't care how young we are or how old or how weak or how sick. These are the central questions as we bow our heads against cold spring sleet, struggling to acknowledge that we do not save ourselves because of fear and we do not stand for others because of ignorance. Let the crocuses bloom and the daffodils unfold and the rain fall. Let the moon rise in the blazing desert. Let us lie under the covering of the cool cotton tent. Let us recognize around this table that we are now in the desert 2,000 years ago, that in the desert, we were in a northern city in a house with pink tablecloths and pink napkins and dear friends. The questions circle us now as then, Exodus everlasting. Mm. I think I'd made some changes to that poem, and this isn't the right one, but but it is it is you know, Passover is a celebration of freedom. And I just got an email this morning that our temple in Buffalo, um, the one that I kind of belong to downtown, is joining together with a Baptist church so that there will be um, a celebration of African-American freedom at the same table. And, the same, and stories and food will be shared from both cultures. Nice. Uh, very nice. So we have time for one more and then okay, maybe a happy, a lighter one. No, it's okay. You could... Yeah, here's a little one. Should it be modern haiku? Evening approaches, loosening of scarves, ties, top coats, tongues, porch lights, lamps, ovens slowly turn on. Evening approaches. Three-year-old boy puts on Batman pajamas. Tired mother chooses books to read in bed later. Evening approaches. Trees droop, branches, leaves are closing. Dogs ask one more time, will you walk with me? Evening approaches. Moon looks down. Good night, people. Dear dreams, please sugar my sleep tonight. <laughs> mm, nice. So very nice. And with some sugar and sweetness. Yeah, I was gonna say, I think we went from my inquiry to politics to sugar. Yeah, I think Irene, you covered the whole <laughs> the whole landscape there. <laughs> well, thank you so much for listening. And it is uh, one o'clock. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. No, it's a great hour. And uh Rebecca and Zachary, thank you for sharing your your personal part of your personal stories. It's always uh, adds a lot of flavor to the program. Um, and thanks to everyone with their, their comments. <laughs> Thank and you. I think uh, Wendy may come back on. So I uh, know Irene, thanks again. I know you've been a long time listener. So, and you've been very patient to so, uh, wait for your time and it's been well, a real no, joy to, yeah. 
too too nervous. It was much easier to say. It was much easier to listen to ten of them before you did. <laughs> Irene, thank you so much, and thanks to all of you for joining us, John. Thank you for another fantastic hour of poetry. Hope to see you all next week. Okay. Yep. Yes. So much. Great.